And so the thing to me about anger as an emotion is it is the best one to me that illustrates how gendered these emotions are in our society. Because little boys, people will talk to little boys about anger, but not other emotions that much. And that's shown in study after study after study. So even a mom reading a book will tend to use more words about anger and aggression if she's reading the book to a son. But to a daughter, she'll kind of pass those words and she'll emphasize other forms of emotion. And that's true whether you're doing art with a child or whether you're talking about a movie. And it's so subtle and, and nuanced. But that leaves boys with some pretty poor options, which are anger, ex- like it's sort of a physical explosive anger, or silence. Now, I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speakers, an award-winning writer, activist, and media critic, Soraya Shamali is also the director of the Women's Media Center Speech Project, which aims to curb online abuse, increase media and tech diversity, and expand women's freedom of expression. Her writing appears frequently in national and international media, including The Atlantic, Time, HuffPost, and The Guardian. Soraya is joined tonight by fellow activist and writer, Jacqueline Friedman, who has written and edited several books, including her latest, which has the same name as her podcast, Unscrewed, Women, Sex, Power, and How to Stop Letting the System Screw Us All. Tonight, they are discussing Soraya's new book, as you know, Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger. True to its title, it has been hailed as explosive, vital, and unapologetic. Gloria Steinem raves that Rage Becomes Her will, quote, be good for women and for the future of this country. Even the New York Journal of Books writes, if you think Senator Warren persisted, Meet Soraya Shamali and her latest book. We are so excited to host this event here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Friedman and Soraya Shamali. Okay, I'm going to start with a softball. As you know, but other people here may not, I start off my podcast every time by oh. asking what's been making you happy this week. But in honor of your book, I'm going to ask you what's been making you angry this week. What's been making me angry this week? Um, Kavanaugh's been making me angry oh. this week. That's pretty much like the central focus of my anger. Yeah. Should like, we dive right into that? Sure. Okay. I mean, there's really nothing about him that doesn't make me angry. So here's my present Kavanaugh question that was formed as the news started to break today. I don't know how many of you have followed the breaking news about Kavanaugh today, it's not quite fully formed, so it's it's mostly rumor, uh, but it may be so that a woman is coming forward with a story of what is so far characterized as sexual misconduct by Kavanaugh, possibly when they were in high school together. The details are all hazy, but everyone is sort of chattering about it. Diane Feinstein evidently has some documentation and the woman is lawyering up. On the way over here, I put on the album Jagged Little Pill, because it seemed like the right thing to play on the way over right. here. And I was thinking about the cyclical nature of when we talk about women in anger. I was thinking about when that album came out and I was in my early 20s and it was just like a total revelation that a woman younger than me even could be just like that up front about how angry right. she was about a lot of really important shit. Um, and everyone talked about it it was this great groundbreaking thing and then like a few and then you know at the same time we kind of had the riot girls and then like a few years later we had the spice girls and then the pussycat dolls and um you know lana del rey the sad girls yes and so similarly you know at that time we also had anita hill right it's possible with this breaking news that is not quite fully formed yet that we are heading for a replay of that kind of a hearing for a supreme court nominee and I'm just wondering what you think about sort of the cyclical nature of the topic of women and anger and like how we can break the cycle and just sort of break through that that memory hole that seems to swallow up the conversation every time it starts right. to gain traction. So I think there are a couple of things. One is that in times of general political agitation and tumult, women are given more freedom to be angry. So the cyclical nature is tied to that pattern too, right? It's it's not just sort of peaks and 
close of feminism, although I will say that any political tumult ultimately at its core is feminist focused, right? We don't call it feminism, but if it's workers' rights or immigrant rights or the environment or the climate, really if you're doing those things properly, they're profoundly feminist. And we don't really categorize them that way, right? And they involve a lot of anger. And so it feels to me at my age, which is 52, 52, um, that it's a two step forward, one step back, two step forward, one step back. And so the way I sort of not despair is to think of how backlash levels up. So like Phyllis Schlafly would never have called herself a feminist, but the Phyllis Schlafly's of today have to speak within the framework of feminism, using the language of feminism. And so structurally, they've adopted feminist principles, even if they are, their, their stand might be abhorrent to me personally or to you. In fact, the overall way that they're approaching problems is much more feminist than they would have been 40 years ago. And I could be fooling myself. But so if we are about to have a hearing about a Supreme Court nominee and sexual misconduct, mm -hmm. how do you think it might go down differently this time? Um, I think that the main difference in my mind is not what's going to happen in the confirmation hearings, which are what they are in, a, in an environment that is really governed by some really conservative misogynists. I think it's the media response and the proliferation of information that was unavailable 30 years ago. It just didn't exist. And so the kind of pushback that we see, the kind of information that is spread that catalyzes social action is a notable difference. And then the other thing that I would love to talk about is that now we have a generation of, of women that grew up with Title IX. And we think of Title IX in terms of sports, but really what we're talking about is leadership and girls who went through athletics in a way that enabled them to use their bodies and to think differently about aggression and anger and regulating those things or using those things. And I think we see that in the, pol in the politics of the day. I think we see that in the unabashed ability of young women to say, I am angry, or I'm not angry, I'm just being aggressive, or yeah, I'm really aggressive, I'm not angry at all. They can make those distinctions, whereas most people don't want them to. They really want to conflate the assertiveness and the anger and, and the aggression. So you think the generation coming up has better emotional literacy around their anger? I think, I still wouldn't call it emotional literacy around anger. I don't think we ever really talk to people that much about anger. I keep thinking about this thing. Uh, I got to interview Soraya a couple of weeks ago for my podcast, which, which is also super called fun. Unscrewed. So if you if you think this is awesome and you want more, you can yes, go listen, listen to that episode. Um, and I keep thinking about a thing we talked about a little on that episode, which was, you know, I think that the uh, you talk a lot in the book about all the ways that women are prevented from accessing anger. Um, in terms of social sanction, right? But I think the other end of that is that a lot of women are afraid of embodying anger because the only model we see for expressing anger is a male model for expressing anger, right. and men aren't doing a super awesome job of that, right? Um, <laughs> as a whole, <laughs> That's not true. all men. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and so I feel like we literally just culturally lack models of what it means to sort of stand in the power of your anger, whatever your gender, without being terrifying and destructive. Right. And so a lot of women, I think, are, even if they're like, fuck society standards, they're still afraid to stand in that because they don't want to be like men. They don't want to be destructive and negative. Yeah. And yes. And so, like, what is that, what do we have to do? Like, what, so, I mean, I honestly think that we need progressives to take over school boards and write textbooks yes. and and have a commitment to institutions that's much more comfortable for people who are probably more traditional and who are vested in institutions in a different way. Because if we don't start right at the beginning, then we just end up losing so much time. And, and so you end up with generation after generation after generation coming to these conclusions pretty late if they come to them at all, and then having to unlearn things, which is why very often for women, their revolutionary stages in their 40s or 50s, not 
in their teens or their 20s. And so the thing to me about anger as an emotion is it is the best one to me that illustrates how gendered these emotions are in our society. Because little boys, people will talk to little boys about anger but not other emotions that much. And that's shown in study after study after study. So even a mom reading a book will tend to use more words about anger and aggression if she's reading the book to a son. But to a daughter, she'll kind of pass those words and she'll emphasize other forms of emotion. And that's true whether you're doing art with a child or whether you're talking about a movie. And it's so subtle and, and nuanced. But that leaves boys with some pretty poor options, which are anger, Ex, like a, sort of a physical explosive anger or silence and in either case they end up not being able to talk about emotions not being able to express how they feel and then you end up in the most extreme cases with violence and suicide and then girls are never taught anything really about how to talk about anger or feel anger or use anger but they're taught about all these other emotions and you end up with a system where we're thought of as the you know, everything about us screams emotionality, and then emotionality is used to undermine us politically or professionally because we are irrational and illogical, and then from that come all of the many slurs and right. terms for women. Right. So, so I, I mean, honestly, I would say it requires a long-term plan and strategy for early childhood education and on. All right. Yeah. That's your charge, everyone. That's, that's what we got to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I I want to hook a tiny hole in that. I think that's correct overall. Uh, but I also know that you were in touch with your anger from a very young age and yeah. not because your family taught you to do that or anybody taught you to do that. But I didn't manage it at all. Okay. Yeah. But I have super curiosity about why you were able to. There's this great story that you tell, which is in the book, about like being a... Yeah. And being told to sort of clear the table and your brother was sitting there feeling smug and not having My to do anything. My cousin's over there. He can um, <laughs> And you being like, no. No. Like, no, Just not until no. he has to do it, too. I'm not having doing it. And you're eight years old. <laughs> like, uh, Well, it was an interesting what, time, how right? How did you, like, do you think that's temperamentally some people, some women are more suited to that? Like, did you get born with a superpower? Uh, you know what, I think, it's, I think it's super interesting, right? Because my brother and I were really close, and we did everything together. And so we felt equal, and we felt like peers. And if you're a child, you have an exquisite sense of fairness. And if you're Catholic, and my mother had converted to Catholicism, and my father was Catholic and very, you know, they were like traditional, you also are constantly hearing about ideas about fairness or kindness and so in this particular moment I thought well that's just wrong like I don't really understand what's happening here and I've learned all these lessons and I'm not getting up because he's got to get up too it didn't help that he had a complete shitting grin on his face right so the, what I think of that moment though is what I really think is my dad because my dad went through what I call the five phases of patriarchal grief. When you realize that your daughter is like you, but she's a girl and you don't know what to do, right? Like how many dads are like, shit, she's like me, but this is not good, right? And so he sort of went through, how dare you talk to me that way? And then you're talking to me this way and then if you don't do this, I don't know, you won't watch TV. And then it was just resignation, right? And then he's like, get up and help your sister. So, <laughs> so I, you know, and I honestly think that despite the fact that I had all of these conflicts with my father over his very traditional ideas and my mother was quite traditional, she was really subversive. She was so quietly subversive in her own way and she managed somehow to convey to all of us that we had the right to be our own people, which was a gift. Like, And I didn't have fear. That was the other thing that was really important. So many people have fear. I knew my dad would not hurt me. He wasn't going to hit me. He wasn't going to scream at me. The worst thing that he would do was look at my mother, and then my mother would say, go get the belt, and then nothing would happen. Right? That was like as That's bad as it got. a weird little ritual. Well, go get the belt was meant to scare you because you were going to be spanked, but they never spanked us. So it <laughs> never worked, right? <laughs> so, so I just didn't feel fear. 
Interesting. Yeah. Well, and I guess I'll keep it going with my other question about motherhood, because there's a whole chapter about motherhood and mothers and anger, which, right. you know, are not supposed to mix. And, and You're not really ever supposed to be really angry because you're a mom. Right. Yeah. So I imagine you didn't hold to that as a mother. Hold to not being angry? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. It was really hard to be angry. I found it really hard. But I also don't feel like I had a lot of reasons to be angry with my kids. But they saw you be angry. I mean, like, I've seen you fight oh, battles yeah. with the school. About... Yeah, they saw me be angry. And so... But it was never like a... They only saw me be explosively angry once, and they remember it clearly. <laughs> they will... They are like... They just really remember it. But it was scary. It was scary for them. It was scary for me. It just wasn't... didn't feel good, you know? And so... Um, but we talk. I did talk to them all the time. And do you feel like they... In the end, I mean, you know, they're the youngest are college age now, right? Um, are more prepared to be in their own anger because they had you as a mom. I think so. I think they are. They're more comfortable with expressing negative emotions. They're more comfortable with saying, "I'm not going to do this." They're more comfortable not being people pleasers. But I also think that, you know, even and you and I, we know this ourselves. Even though intellectually. You can understand a problem or understand ideas. You're still in the culture and of the culture, and you live in it. And so things happen, and you catch yourself. You're like, what just happened? How did I let that happen? Why did I do that? And I think that's just part of human nature. It actually ties into the question I wanted to ask you next, and, and I promise I'm just going to have a couple more questions, and I, I don't have to keep Sora all to myself, and then you guys are going to get to ask questions. Um, so I was on this morning BuzzFeed's Twitter news show, AM to DM, for people who live on the internet. Um, <laughs> and they were we were talking about Les Moonves and CBS. Wow, um, yeah. And the Does everybody know about that? No, can you explain it like two seconds? No. It's just bad. <laughs> Let's just say it was really bad. <laughs> Nobody can really explain it. Just Google it. No, I mean, basically, allegations were made. They were horrible. This man retained his job, very high level, in an organization that has now had multiple men. He retained his job after the allegations. He only started to lose it when the board yes. that stood by him after the, the first set of allegations discovered that he had lied to them. So, like... Him sexually yes. abusing and assaulting women in his employ Nothing. was okay. Him fucking with them was, was not not okay. Um, right. Just it was like profoundly cynical. But the the thing that I want to get to is um, we were talking about I'm forgetting the name of the woman, the woman who created Designing Woman. Yes, Linda, who um, wrote that fantastic essay. Blood, yes, thank you, Blood Linda Thompson. Bloodworth Thompson wrote this fantastic essay that was in I think Variety mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. Um, about basically how Les Moonves did not sexually harass her, but basically decided he didn't like her feminist content and sunk her career over it. Um, and so we were talking about that a little, and which was definitely about rage because that was some cleansing rage in that yeah. piece. Um, I, I, that's a great read for anybody. It is a really good read. Uh, we were talking about that a little, and they asked me, like, well, what advice would you have for a woman who finds herself in a similar position today? And I started to answer, and then I was like, do you know what? And I didn't say it like this, of course, but I, mean, I basically was like, this is a bullshit question. Yeah, like, this, not, yeah. this gets to lean in territory, right. because the problem isn't her and what she did. The problem is everyone around her. Right. And so... That's right. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the question shouldn't be, like, what advice do you give to women who are in that situation? The question is, like, what advice do you give to someone who's observing that situation or has power over that situation or becomes aware of it or is not aware of it but should be, right? right. Like, what do we do to make the world, I mean, outside of early childhood education, like, yeah. the adults that already exist, like, how do we change the system so that women are free to be angry without being penalized and, and losing their careers? So I've pretty much been reduced to public shaming, because... I'm all for a good yeah, public shaming. so Jacqueline and I bonded over public shaming. We did! And that's really what happened. <laughs> but, but in fact, if you are a good girl, and you've leaned in, and you've worked hard, and... 
you've paid a whole lot for school and you've gone to work and you've checked all the boxes and then you meet asshole number one because you will meet that person, right? And you try your best and maybe you leave that job because you don't want to ruffle feathers. I mean, if you haven't experienced it, someone you know has experienced it, right? And so at this stage, because it's so stubborn and persistent and because, and, and this is what I'll say about this, what I've noticed is in every sector you can talk about, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, Wall Street, politics, media, whatever it is, there are all these hardworking people, especially women forming networks to fight for equality within their sector, right? So we do it in media, mm -hmm. right? But the way that this works, the way that abusive men derive power and they can sustain their predatory practices isn't even so much the domination they have in each industry, it's the benefit they get from the overlap between the networks. So if you're this man, you can count on Wall Street still giving you money, and you can count on the Wall Street Journal to still write glowing profiles of you, and you can count on Silicon Valley to create products that inhibit people who have marginalized voices from speaking freely by exacerbating abuse. And so all of those sort of concentric circles of, um, well, will just get wonky, right? So if you think it's like white supremacist, hetero, uh, heteropatriarchal supremacy that works globally across all of these sectors, that's what it is. And it's really hard to fight. And no one individual is ever, ever going to solve that problem, right? right. And she's not going to be able to change her behavior to solve that problem. So um, one of the things I appreciate right now that I also think is very different, and I have experienced this in the last 10 years, and it's how we work and how we work. I mean, so many people in this room I know and we've been doing this work, is that you can form pretty strong, incredibly nimble, flexible networks that move uh, in huge support globally in different ways. I mean, the, the campaign that Jacqueline and I designed in 2013 was a campaign to fight misogyny on Facebook because we got fed up with getting rape threats and death threats and then we realized how many other writers were getting this content and we started talking to them and then we realized we, you know we sort of did a deep deep dive into this into this problem and I tried really nicely for nine months to work with Facebook at very high levels and what I got was the feminist pat on the head and so Jacqueline called me one day because she had, she was the executive director of something called Women Action in the Media, and I was a member of that. She said, let's do something. And so we called a, a woman named Laura Bates in England, who was a friend of mine, and she had started something called Everyday Fe Feminism. And Everyday Sexism. Everyday Sexism. And, and in about four days, we had over 100 organizations globally sign on to this campaign. And then when we kicked it off, within two or three days, they would lost almost $20 million, and then they paid attention. And right? they caved within, was specific, it was like precisely one week. Oh, it was, and, yeah. And activists had been trying for years. For years, and so the difference was that we took money. That's what it was, it was money. And and, and the global coalition. Uh, well, definitely the global yes. coalition. And you know, that when we were going to bed, the Australians yes. were like, Right, you know, waking up and getting onto the hashtag, right? right? But, like, but, I mean, honestly, <laughs> we could do that though. Like, we literally had a schedule, and yeah. we said, "Okay, we're going to take these six hours." You're, and it just went round the world like this. And so, but but honestly, we could do that, and we could never have done that before. So while I really, really find some of the cesspool deplorable, I do value this immensely. Networks. networks, networks. Use network power. Women. Use network power in your favor because it's definitely being used against you. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna save the swearing question to the end. Okay. Because uh, I feel like it's not. It's that's a really good heavy question. Like, <laughs> I can't transition to it. So let's hear some of your questions. Yeah, we would love to hear questions. Yes. Yeah. And calling Susan Collins. Yes. Yes. 
Right. Oh, see, we'll oh. just we'll go right there. I guess there. we'll talk about this right. Well, it's these women are. It's women, right. Yeah. And in French. <laughs> yes. So there, there are a couple of things that I just, I want to just des- describe so that it's not just a matter of our anecdotes, which we have, right? So we know that power accrues to men when they're angry. When they display anger, people trust them more. They think they're more confident. They think they have more authority. And so when men say, as they do, that they associate power with anger, it is because it generally works that way. Now, that's not uniformly true, right? Because it all implicates status. So a black man cannot be angry the way a white man can. It's impossible. He's automatically considered criminal. Which colored the entire Obama presidency. Which colored the whole, like the anger translator was real. Like we all laughed, but that was a real thing, right? And so, so men though in courtrooms, in the medical field, uh, pick pick your space. It doesn't really matter. If a man wigs out, he's okay with. I mean, people, I mean, should we talk about Serena Williams? Right. But but let me finish with one thing here because <laughs> what was interesting to me about what you said in politics was that constantly with Hillary Clinton, you would hear that she was playing a gender card. And in fact, the gender card, the most powerful gender card that was played, was Trump and Sanders's ability to look unhinged and leverage populist anger. Yes. They literally would like show up looking scruffy and their hair was all over the place and they'd like pound a table and say something and then everybody would go wild. And then people would turn around and accuse her of being inauthentic and stiff and on and on and on and on. So when women, as they do say that anger makes them feel powerless, it's because indeed it exacerbates powerlessness. And we saw that with Serena this weekend. Can I talk a little brass tacks political strategy briefly? Um, I always advocate an inside outside strategy. And what that means is you have to have some people who are willing to play nice with her and be polite and be insiders and like take the meetings and like say, yes, it's a very smart question. And like, you know, like, oh yes, those those protesters are really going too far. You can be working together and just right. disabuse each other and pu- you know disavow each other in public. That's actually the ideal way to do because most of the time on the left, what happens is we just like eat each other over this. Um, <laughs> but actually, if you don't have somebody on the inside to hold her hand, then she just gets entrenched, and you've got two entrenched. You've got like the screamy, angry people on the outside, and she's entrenched right. on the inside and isolated. And if you don't have screamy, terrifying people on the outside, and you just have somebody holding her hand, she has no real incentive to do anything. Right. Um, and so the best, the best formula for this is you people working the inside strategy and playing her game, and people being terrifying and publicly disavowing each other whenever politically expedient. But ideally, like agreeing in private that both strategies actually are the best approach as opposed to one or the other. And to be destabilizing, those rules can change, right? So we have a coalition of organizations that we work with very often when we're dealing with social media companies, and you need to have people who are willing to go along and willing to be in the space, and um, and then you need people who are going to keep pushing so that the center moves. You just push and you push and you push, right, so that you can have a different conversation. And (laughs) we, I remember this so clearly, because this is pretty common, right? So one of the terms of our agreement with Facebook when we made it was that they would work with this coalition all over the world and that they would have meetings locally with women's organizations on the ground that worked at the nexus of violence, free speech, and technology. And so they came back, we went back and forth, back and forth, and they came back with a document that said something, I will work with women's groups. Uh And I'm like, no, 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 can't just say women's groups. Just can't do it so they said no it needs to say women's groups and I said no what it's got to say is like flame-throwing radical feminist lesbians who (laughs) and they were like what and I'm like yeah that's what it's got to say and it sounded so stupid but in fact the minute you push it they're like okay well how do you want women qualified and I'm like I want women qualified by the women that were part of this coalition that signed on to this program yeah and 
like because you move the Overton window. Yeah, by you being just terrifying. Well, you just you're like, really, yeah. is this is what we're gonna do. This is silly waste of time. But you have to kind of do it. And so, right after Trump was elected, and honestly, everyone was despairing. Everyone I knew was despairing, and that's how it felt. But we work a lot on sexual violence and the role it plays in institutions. And what had to happen immediately was all of the anti-rape activist groups had to decide who was going to work with the administration. Because all of the work that had been done was going to be rapidly undone. And that's just a reality that's very hard. It's just the truth. And actually, I mean, what's happening with Kavanaugh, it doesn't really matter because the people who don't want to believe what's happened are not going to believe it. And they're, you know, even if this woman comes forward and she has 20 pages of documentation and photographs, it's irrelevant. I actually already saw somebody on the left saying, it was in high school, why are we talking yeah. about this? And I was like, anyway, yeah. should we talk about the swearing now? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see if there are any more questions. Then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you give us some guidance when uh, women are put in a, uh, in a position to stop other women? Oh, yes. Guidance, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this. like When I started writing this book, I had a chapter that was just called Other Women. Because that's a huge issue, right? And so actually, it ended up that I took those parts and I split them up into two chapters specifically, three because all, all, it just became something that was so prevalent. One was the chapter on caring. There's a chapter on caring that got split into a chapter on caring and motherhood. Mothering, yeah. Because mothering and giving birth, actually this idea that to be a real woman you have to give birth was is central, right? And so um, I split them up because we all are socialized in a seriously binary sex segregated mentality and it's not like we can step outside of that. Usually the way we get outside of that is some form of profound alienation or survival, right? You actually have to say, oh my God, what is happening here? I can't breathe, right? Like I, I, I can't function this way. And so what, what women do very often, particularly with anger and with other women, is they double down on femininity so that their anger isn't seen as gender transgressive. So that's why women cry. Right, because here I am. I'm angry. I'm trying. I'm trying to do this thing, but anger is associated with masculinity, and so I'm going to. And this is not conscious. Like I cry when I'm angry because I cannot get the words out. Right, but it feels so transgressive to get the words out. If I type it, I don't have a problem on earth. Right, anything can come out of my fingers, and it cannot come out of my mouth. But that performance of femininity to put people at ease is part of that idea that you're supposed to just make sure everyone around you is comfortable and set aside your own dignity or needs or or the fact that you've just been humiliated or you know the, like all of that gets pushed back and subsumed and uh, I mean I have 70 pages of citations here because I just like research and don't really want to fight with people if they want to fight they can go fight with the CDC I'm like how about it's like my research librarian <laughs> if I'm writing something and I'm like I know there's a study about this. I asked Saraj. She no, knows where it is. But, but I, yeah, I want to say one other thing about that, though. That's true at work. It's true in academia. It's true virtually in any setting. And p politically, historically, women who've been very angry and have turned that in political power, the vehicle that we tend to accept it in is as mothers. So mothers against drunk driving, moms for, say, in gun control. Um, children's Defense Fund, Moms Rising. It's like if you just tick that box that says you understand what your role is, then we'll let you say your piece. But if you don't, then we're just going to shut you down. You know, I do this on purpose uh, when I go on TV or into conservative rooms to talk about sexual violence. I always make sure that I look... I do that too. I sort of smoothed down. I mean, like, you and I both gravitate toward a feminine right. appearance in general but with more of a sort of playfulness and edge yes. but like I'm always like you know like pearls if necessary right because I feel like <laughs> I feel like I will be listened to more Absolutely. if I look acceptably female 
Um, and I have angry, uncomfortable right. things to talk about. Yeah, that's right. Did, there, a few years ago, there was a great study done. They looked uh, the the study. The researchers looked at media coverage of women politicians, and they found that uh, conservative women politicians are simply prettier. They're just prettier, and. And they define it. No, this is what's so funny. They defined pretty. The whole thing was interesting as traditionally feminine. So so you had multiple levels going on, right, of what constituted pretty and what what that meant in the study, outside of the study. And so but what they basically were saying was you look at someone like Sarah Palin. And she was attractive in this, you know, everyone talked about how attractive she was. And then they plastered her, her picture on, like, Time or Newsweek. And she was in shorts. And um, what that, of course, does, like the idea that we have all this emotionality, is undermine our competence. Because the minute you sexualize a woman, you actually alter the way people perceive her in the brain. And she becomes less competent, less authoritative. And... We usually talk about pornography. Well, but also it's so raced, right? Like if you it's think so about raced. Sarah Palin in shorts versus Michelle Obama in so raced. Her top. sleeves. Like, yeah, her yes. arms. Anyway. Um. But I will say this, too, because I don't think a lot of... I always say this whenever I can, and my children would like it not to be the dinner table with their friends. But, <laughs> but it's true that what happens to women politicians uniformly is that they're turned into pornography. And profusely, it turned into pornography. The more powerful they are, so um, I had the very unpleasant experience because I wanted to understand this problem of looking to see what was happening. And it was while the Obamas were in the White House, and it didn't matter what side of the political spectrum. So it was Condoleezza Rice, Nancy Pelosi, um, name any sort of high, high-profile woman. If the woman had a child, like Hillary Clinton and her daughter, the porn was mother-daughter porn. I could not bear to look at the Obama situation because I was just so horrified. And um, men, if you Googled any of the male candidates for that election, you got their opinions about porn, like what they thought about porn, except for President Obama because he's a black man. And if you similarly objectify and debase a black man by sexualizing him that way, um, you, you sort of have the same effect. I will say if you're interested in that conversation, we did a whole podcast yeah. episode of my podcast about it a couple of years ago called yeah. Naked Politics. Well, and um, one last thing, because yes. this is a fascinating topic to, in my mind. Pornhub has some of the best market research of any website available. It's a riot. Like, they research everything. And in 2016, the top four searches for American men who make up the vast majority of consumers of Pornhub were MILF. Does everyone know what that is? MILF, stepmom, lesbian, and I can't remember the fourth. And they were basically, oh, and mom. All women with authority or women who have rejected men. And I'm like, well, that's an interesting thing just to be completely, constantly getting off on, you know? And so you can't really, I don't see how you can separate that issue of sexual objectification. And it doesn't have to be porn. It can literally be the bus going by. The minute we see a woman's leg and their skin and you don't see her head, the same mechanism trips in your brain. And it's everywhere. And it's undermining our political authority. And tears, yes. Tears. White women's tears. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. No, there's reward for that. Yes. A weapon. One is people wondered, how could all those white women vote for Trump? And that made total sense to me because, you know, fragile white femininity has been a lever of racial oppression since the beginning of the country's origins. And so we saw that again and again. And what Trump was peddling was this toxic border patrol masculinity in which 
black people were racist, China would rape us, Mexicans were rapists. I mean, every time you blinked, something something was happening in the imagination that included this notion of violation of a man's property, although it didn't come out that way. And what's interesting to me... Well, it's perfectly fine when he does it. Perfectly fine when he does it. But what's interesting to me, too, about all these women, all of whom have nicknames, that are literally patrolling their streets, right? They don't have this sort of macro political power because... Actually, women in the GOP have lost authority, lost power. Their numbers are declining. If we only looked at the GOP and we looked at metrics comparing ourselves to other countries, we would literally rank with, with like semi-authoritarian countries that are at the very bottom because there are so few women actually represented in the party. But they're doing at a very local level what's happening at this national level. And as you say, they can weaponize those tears. And the interesting thing that we never talk about is the profound inequality of white women in Christian evangelical homes. And the fact that authoritarianism is most um, vibrant in areas of the world that have gender inequality. Because what women do then is they look for a strong leader. They look for a strong man. And anything that they can leverage for status, in this case, white supremacy, is what they're going to leverage. And I think that's what happened. And we see it every day, as you said. I mean, whether it's at a pool or at a shopping mall or in the car or the lemonade stand, it's just a little micro version of what's happening on our borders or in our foreign policy. Can we talk about cursing now? <laughs> you wanna fucking talk about cursing already? Um, I, I'll tell you why I wanted to talk about it because um, I saw a lot in the past couple of days about Serena Williams and what she said. And all these, I don't know how many people saw the videotapes of male tennis players screaming and cursing, right? And one of the kind of policing mechanisms of girls and women in their language is about obscenity, the use of obscenity and what the use of obscenity represents. It just, you know, at the most basic level, not being ladylike. But one of the things that I found most interesting was that I have a chapter in here about health. We didn't really talk about that at all. But the, the name of the book actually also reflects this idea that rage becomes material in the body, like physically material in the body, and we don't talk about that. So all these women's ailments like anxiety, depression, eating disorders, the salient thread is uh, a very deeply uh, repressed anger or an inability to articulate anger and it, it just becomes part of the body and it inhibits your ability it, it, it will crush your immune system it makes it very difficult to bounce back from illnesses and there are all of these things that anger is implicated in and when you feel pain and we treat women's pain the way we treat women's anger which is mainly to trivialize or downplay it or ignore it um, or try and push it aside when you feel pain very often, you stub your toe, you curse, if you're me. Maybe not everyone curses, but your inclination is to have a verbal kind of outburst. And it turns out that that actually helps you deal with pain. It's not just that it comes out of your mouth, but it helps you deal with pain. So if you're in the hospital, for example, and you're experiencing pain, or you're in the dentist, um, it turns out people really don't like it when women curse, and they reduce their level of care which bowled me right over. I was like, really, in addition to all the other stuff, like in the medical profession that we know there's so much bias in the medical profession, racial bias and gender bias, and, and I thought, you can't even curse? Like, if you're really in pain? Yes, yeah. And I write a lot about nursing, actually, because a lot of the studies I looked at had to do with nurses who perform a profoundly maternal function nursing, teaching, all the jobs that women do that are service-oriented and that are emotionally intense, lots of anger. But, you know, on top of it, a lot of our curse words have deeply misogynist oh, yeah. roots. Like, uh, just like, if, even if you think of, like, the etymological mechanics of fuck, right? Like, who, like, to what does it mean to fuck somebody up or to get fucked or to, you know, like, who's imagined to be on the receiving end or, or suck for that matter right. or like, all of that all of it is like about sexual dominance and in, a, in an imagine imagined to be in an incredibly gendered way and I I rant about this whenever I get the occasion but I can't let go of fuck because it's too much fun to say 
Um, <laughs> so you you saw this. So this this cover, the first draft of it. Yes. It had. I really liked it, but it had the words, "Rage becomes her," and it looked like you were doing this. And I was like, I "Okay, that's fine with me." But then I looked at it and I was like, "Oh, it's so phallic." I'm like, I just can't do it. I really like it. But then I'm going to have to spend a year explaining how I could use a phallic symbol for women's rage. <laughs> it was that conversation. So we ended up with this, which is, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I want a feminist vernacular of, like, curse words. Yeah, yeah. I know. That would be good. Well, are, does anybody have any other questions? I think we're, we're probably good. Anything else? We oh, there's time one in the back. One in the back? One over there. Hey, how are you? Right. That's a great question. So here's the epiphany I had writing this book, which my dear friend Catherine has heard and which Jacqueline has heard. But I can't. I keep just coming back to this because it was as a, re- a direct result of Trump's election. But I keep thinking, and when I read it, when I wrote the book, so much of the anger that women describe and feel has to do with their intimate interactions. And I will include in that relationships at work, because so much work anger actually comes down to this management of relationships. And the model of the way we manage anger in our intimate lives becomes the model in which we manage anger in our public lives. So it's important to think about what those dynamics are. So some of the angriest women in the world are women who are in heterosexual marriages. And I learned this today, and I really wish I'd had it for the book. The more children they have with each child, the more angry they get. (laughs) This is not news to some of us, but it's nice to have a chart, right? You're like, there's the chart, right? So, So the thing about this, though, is a lot of it comes down to men kind of doing masculine things or performing in the ways that they learned made them good men. And often that comes down to providing and protecting because what boy, by the time he's 10, hasn't understood that he's supposed to somehow provide and protect? The problem with provide and protect is that it's very misleading and it's virtually impossible. So no man can protect the women in his life cannot follow them to school or work or down the street or into a bathroom or online. And although should not. Shouldn't, right? <laughs> but, but, this is, but this is an impossible ideal for men, but it is the ideal that they have, right? And so when Trump was elected, I realized that a lot of men who were disturbed by this also had a serious crisis because so many women were upset and they couldn't do anything about it. They were powerless to do anything about it. And I thought, you know, the issue here is that when I say I'm mad about street harassment, I'm mad about the threat of rape, I'm mad because I couldn't get a word out and this man interrupted me 50 times in 90 minutes, right? I say that and it gets turned in, I think, many men's brains into I'm failing. I'm failing to do the job of protecting this woman that I love or I'm responsible for. And I think brothers feel that. I think fathers feel that. And so we need to find a way of developing a healthy masculinity that doesn't depend on women's vulnerability. And so the chapters on, and that's true of providing too, the fact that women can make money and support themselves and their families and have indeed been doing that for a very long time is a direct threat to male identity. It's not just that we're competing in the workplace, it's that men's identities are built around this idea that that is that, their job. And that's hard to shake. And you see that in par- patterns of marriage. So the more money a woman makes, the more likely it is that her husband will leave or that he'll have affairs or that he'll stop doing housework. I mean, it's not even conscious, it just happens. And so I think that what I wrote in these two chapters on silencing and denial is that it's really hard to be a woman and you say these things and to have the men around you, even your friends or your family, not listen or not believe you or mock you. And I've had those experiences and I can't really think of any women that I know that haven't had those experiences. But on the flip side, jump in and try to fix it. Jump in and try and and fix it. Right. And so I think that one thing men can do is to really stop talking and listen and to put themselves aside and say, what happens if I just listen to this person and 
I do what she says she wants as opposed to what I've been told I'm supposed to be doing. And that's hard too. So what I say to men in institutional spaces is the only way you're going to fulfill those roles and do these things that you feel make you a good person is to fight for systemic change. You cannot tolerate these behaviors in other men because we don't have the power as women to police men. We can't stop the jokes. We can't stop the harassment. We can grow better boys, but those boys are so subject to rigid masculinity norms that they get punished. And they get punished by dads. That's also pretty evident from studies. So does that answer your question? All right, I have a closing question. Yeah. So you and I both read uh, The Power by Naomi Alton. Yes, who's read this book? <laughs> I'm sure they have copies here. It's red and black, too. We should have had it on the table. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> Where is this book? Um, in which teenage girls wake up and suddenly discover they have the power to deliver electric shocks. Like eels. Like eels. And it changes the world. And it doesn't make it better. No. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> How do you think the world would be different if every woman woke up tomorrow feeling really comfortable expressing and acting on her anger? Oh, so uncomfortable. It would be so uncomfortable for everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine if this happened? What would happen? Well, that's my question. (laughs) If every woman woke up and expressed um, her unhappy... Really free and comfortable with her anger. Oh, I think we'd be in free fall. You think, like, society would collapse? Well, the thing that occurs to me is that, like, you said that, and the first thing I thought of was economics. Because what happened to me with economics was all these social sciences, women started going to these social sciences, and men picked up their toys and they went to economics. That's what happened, right? They're like, we're just not going to stay here and be with you because you're competing with us and you're doing well, so economics is going to be the social science. And even that, even that... Yes, but now we never give it a no, no, I'm getting to the, I know, I'm getting to the anger, though, because <laughs> the thing that really galls me is that so much of women's anger comes from the mandate that we care, and we care, and we care, and we care, and we care until we're, like, 85, and then we can't care anymore, and then we miraculously feel good about ourselves, which is what happens, right? And so... In our economic models, we we don't really count that care work still. It's still an externality. Oh, I understand right? what you're saying. And so I'm thinking, well, if women are comfortable, if women are comfortable expressing anger and doing something about it, they're gonna stop doing the care work that supports the entire economy. Mm. Right? I know this sounds ridiculous. No. Bear with me. Okay? But if you actually just stop doing it. And you said, you know, I'm just not doing this anymore. I, I, but nobody can afford to do it because capitalism, right? Capitalism. It's there. We need capital. We have to eat. We have to rent things. So what's not anger? I'm angry about this. Yes. Do something about it. Yes. Yes. But to change it, it would be a very would be sudden a real shock crisis. to the economy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. So that was the sort of right. skipping stone of my brain that didn't give you the answer you wanted. Let's burn it all down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. There's a movement in Australia called Destroy the Joint, and I've been waiting for it to spread like wildfire. It hasn't quite done so that yet. Women's anger could take down capitalism, is what you're saying. Oh, I I think if anything takes down capitalism, it will be women's anger. All right, let's leave it right there. Right there. That's it. That's it.